Hi, I'm Alex Chalkias, Kubernetes Product Manager at Canonical. Last KubeCon, we ran a survey that asked a question that went something like, what can you not do with Kubernetes? The most popular answer was, make coffee. Now, we all thought that was funny to put that as a possible answer in the survey, but we kind of did not expect people to run with it. So there we were with our Kubernetes and Cloud Native Operations survey, an abundance of useful data about where the technology is going, which you can check in the link shown below, what challenges people are facing, and a clear sign that coffee is still the fuel that is powering the clouds. Then we started thinking about this as a story. Kubernetes, cloud native, coffee. Hmm. If we were to make coffee using Kubernetes, how would we do it? And how could we leverage cloud native technologies and Kubernetes operators to build an open source, multi-cloud, Kubernetes loving coffee machine? That sounds like unnecessarily overcomplicated fun. And this is where my friend Pedro came in. Yeah, so Alex came to me and he asked um, if I was up to make some coffee of Kubernetes. Um, and I loved the idea. Uh, I really believe that there is no project that is too silly, um, provided you want to work on it and you learn something new at the end. Um, at first, I thought about maybe you could run some part of Kubernetes into a, mi in a microcontroller. But that was a bit optimistic with, with 32k of instruction RAM and the time that we had to work on this project. Uh, then I thought about using one of those huge um, professional coffee machines uh, that just press the buttons on the touch screen and the coffee starts brewing down. But those things are fully fledged Linux systems. They're more powerful than a laptop. That would be totally cheating. So we came up with our own way to make coffee using cakes. Uh, but before that, let me just introduce myself. Uh, my name is Pedro. I've been connecting things to the internet since before the term IoT was, was widespread. Uh, I also work as a product leader Canonical and uh, the publishers of Ubuntu. And I uh, help the Kubernetes, the IoT, the cloud teams uh, with some special projects, including making coffee with Kubernetes, I guess. Uh, but all the, the projects that I'm going to show, all the tools that I'm going to show uh, today, they're all open source, they're free, uh, they're community driven, and they welcome contributions from anyone. Um, and as you can see in the title or the subtitle, uh, this is not a story about Kubernetes on the edge, it's a story about Kubernetes beyond the edge. So how uh, we interact uh, with the cluster from a microcontroller point of view or from a hardware engineer point of view. So how do we feed information to the cluster? How do we uh, interact with our environment with the information generated uh, uh, in the cluster? Uh, before I got started on this project, I set a few ground rules. Um, first of all, I wanted to make real coffee, no virtual coffee, no commands, just, just, just coffee at the end. Um, it, the tools had to be open source, um, and um, my server had to be uh, hosted on Kates. This is a Kates convention, after all. And I wanted to avoid vendor lock. And for that, I'm using a project that I'm part of, Juju. And I'm going to talk a bit more uh, about, a bit more about Juju later and how it, uh, I, I leverage some of its technologies to, to help this project to be uh, vendor lock free. Uh, and also, most importantly, I wanted this to be a fun experience that I've learned a bunch of new things at the end. So this is the fun stack that we came up with. Um, but seriously, um, we are using a bunch of open source projects and this is also a celebration. I want this machine to be a celebration of all the community that support this project. So thank you very much. Um, and you can find links for these communities uh, uh, in our website that is at the end of this presentation. But let's simplify this uh, just a tiny bit. Okay, maybe that's a bit too much, but you get the idea. We want to make coffee, we want to order coffee, and we want to involve Kubernetes. Let's see how this actually works. So we have a touch screen when, where you can place your order. The command, the, the, the command to, to start the order or to make the order, to execute the order, goes to Kubernetes server and from there it goes to the machine or to a microcontroller that is controlling the machine. Uh, so there is no physical connection between the, the, the touch screen and, or, or the, the app that is running, running on, the, on the touch screen and the actual machine. You could you might as well just have this in two parts of the planet and it was to have it was to have coffee at the other end. Quite useless coffee, but anyways. Um, so why Kubernetes? Well, first of all, this is this uh, Kubernetes convention and uh, also because of all the good things that Kubernetes offers and you all know about, it's, it's flexible and robust and uh, I could very easily scale this server or scale these devices uh, quite easily. 
and also the survey and apparently um, Kubernetes operators, human operators still like uh, coffee, as Alex put very well. Um, but getting coffee from this machine is not so simple. Uh, although it is simple, it's not so simple. Uh, first of all, you need to choose where you want your stack of apps to run. Um, uh, to, to, to prove that this is a truly vendor a lock free project, uh, you can select what coffee you want and also what cloud is going to be hosting uh, your server. And uh, the same stack of apps is going to work on any cloud, regardless of, of, of what vendor you're using, or, uh, it, and it doesn't require any special configurations. Uh, it's the same stack on, on different cloud vendors, and you select that on the touch screen. So, but let's uh, dive into each of these parts here. First of all, let's talk quickly about the touch screen. Um, I'm quite happy about uh, the stack that I put together there. Uh, it's running on the Raspberry Pi 4, which is a miracle of technology. Uh, I was like, I, I, I love to think about um, if I could show uh, a Raspberry Pi to uh, an Apollo project engineer, they would, they would probably start crying. And uh, I'm running Ubuntu Core on, 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 as an operating system, and it's a sandboxed uh, operating system, so it offers a very good level of robustness. And then I'm using Ubuntu Frame uh, to give me a full screen uh, shell. Uh, it's based on Wayland. And uh, these two things, the Ubuntu Frame and Ubuntu Core, they help me to avoid these this blue screens of death that you see at airports or, or train stations. Um, and then the actual app, the actual interface is, is run with Flutter and it's a snap uh, app um, and I, I'm using Flutter because I wanted to explore a bit more and learn a bit more on building user interfaces with Flutter so that's why on a second on a second version of this project I'll probably implement I'll also install um, uh, uh, Nbox to run the KubeCon app and, and this way I could scan the badges uh, and have some sort of stats at the end, like oh, CTOs uh, like lattes more than, than sysadmins, uh, or people from this company prefer tea rather than coffee. I don't know, just some silly stats, but uh, I like it, so whatever. Uh, but let's talk about uh, Kubernetes, the actual server running on Kubernetes. Uh, you may have noticed that uh, at some point I had to choose between HTTP and MQTT. And some people will say that you should uh, pick one of them, and uh, they're probably right for most applications. Uh, but I really like the MQTT client for the ESP, and I've, I've used HTTP with Dart and, and Flutter before. So I just decided to go with both to make an experiment and see what a server that accepts both protocols would look like. And these are the projects, that, the tools that I've uh, implemented in, in, in my server and uh, running in my Kubernetes cluster. I had the HTTP is handled by Flask and uh, the uh, publishing and subscribing to, to, the, to the broker is, uh, is handled through uh, Paho. And uh, the information that goes through uh, my server is also stored in a database that feeds uh, Prometheus and, and some nice Grafana dashboards. Uh, as my broker, as, uh, as my MQTT broker, I'm using Mosquito, and Mosquito is just phenomenal. It's an open, open source project that uh, it's the kind of thing that you deploy and you, you forget it's there. It just keeps working. Um, but I really wanted this to be deployable on any cloud vendor or any infrastructure that you wanted. Uh, so if at any moment I wanted to decide, hey, I don't like the prices of this vendor, or I'd like to bring this to my local data center, I could. So how did I implement that? So that's where I use Juju and operators, or more specifically, charmed operators. So the way, uh, long story short, the way that Juju works is you bootstrap Juju to your cloud uh, or to your infrastructure. It can be a VM as well. It's not an operator for Kubernetes in the Kubernetes sense only. And once Juju is bootstrapped, it creates this um, uh, logical layer of abstraction. It's not a, an actual layer, but uh, it allows you to install any app, any stack. You have bundles that you can, you can easily deploy uh, with the same commands uh, on any cloud. So um, you can create your own operator or you can just choose one of the, the hundreds that are available at charmhub.io. And Juju will work, will give you the same experience uh, regardless of the vendor that you're using. You do not need to use Charm, uh, Canonical's Charmed uh, Kubernetes, although I think that Alex will be happy if you do. Uh, but you can use uh, whatever is your favorite uh, flavor of Kubernetes. 
Another cool thing about Juju that makes the life of a hardware engineer quite easy is that uh, the integration, which is a big pain, can be done with a single command. So if you have two charmed operators that are compatible with each other, you can just run Juju relate um, these two uh, operators. And if you would prefer another one, you can, uh, they're, they're interchangeable as long as they're compatible, as long as they have compatible endpoints. And once they're relate, related and integrated, uh, they will work across a multi-cloud or hybrid cloud kind of scenario and Juju will handle that for you. Uh, this is another cool thing. Uh, once you deployed things inside your Juju model, uh, you can reach them through one single, one common uh, Juju CLI. So you can configure your Grafana with the, in, in, uh, the, the it can create a new user in your um, Postgres uh, with the same CLI that you create a new dashboard in the Grafana um, uh, deployment. And uh, that's quite useful uh, because, well, you know where you're, you, you, have, you actually have control over your whole stack and you don't need to dive into a, a sea of, of YAML to understand what's going on. And um, that's, th th this three slides are a very high level view of what Juju is. And I invite you to visit uh, Juju uh, is slash brew to, to get some more information about how we leverage some of Juju technologies into this project and um, also to learn a bit more about Juju. Uh, but let's talk about the actual coffee machine and uh, the electronics and the cool stuff. Uh, so there is a coffee machine and it makes coffee. Um, it's controlled by an ESP8266 and I love this board. It, I think it has enabled so many people to, to interact with their environments and, and uh, so many people have created so, such cool and creative projects uh, with the ESP and it's a really cool board and really accessible as well. Uh, I also wanted to give a, a big shout out to the maintainers of two of the libraries that I've used for this project. The first one is the PubSub client, which is a very simple but super useful MQTT client for the ESP. It just works. It's those kind of libraries that it just works and it takes for granted. But uh, today I wanted to give a big shout out to the maintainer of that project. Uh, then there is the ESP software serial uh, library. And the thing about a software serial or, or serial pins in, in microcontrollers is that uh, Usually microcontrollers, the tiny ones, like the one that I'm using, they only, they only have one serial interface. And I'm using that for my serial to USB converter so I can upload code into the microcontroller. And it's not very good practice to use one serial pin to different purposes. Uh, so I had to use one of the GPIO pins as the serial pin to talk to my LCD screen. Does it make sense? So bear with me. The thing is that my LCD screen uh, the, the 16 by 2 LCD screen that shows the bug information from the microcontroller has a Spartan backpack uh, that converts the parallel pins to a serial interface. But my microcontroller only has one serial port that is connected to my, well, indirectly connected to my USB in my computer. So by using the software serial library, I can use one of the GPIO pins uh, in my board to control my uh, tiny uh, 16 by 2 um, LCD screen. The thing is that this library works super well for Arduino and it's super well maintained, but it doesn't work for ESPs. So a champion just ported that to ESP and is maintaining that. And uh, thank you so much. You make our lives uh, much, much easier. Uh, then I'm actually pressing the buttons on the machine using PWM and uh, I'm getting the information from the sensors in the machine using SPI. But we're going to talk about that next. Well, before that, if we have to give a uh, reparability score to this machine, it would be 3.5. It would be a terrible score. Um, uh, out of the box, you need some uh, Torx screws to, to remove the case um, in this machine. But once you get inside, it's a really fun appliance to hack. Um, mainly because of two things. The buttons, they are capacitive buttons. So capacitive buttons, they work a tiny bit different from uh, actual physical switches. Um, well, they are they use a physical effect as well, but they're different from the, the switches that move. Um, they measure the capacitance in a certain area, and when you put your finger close to it, uh, well, the water in your finger in, in your body will act as a dielectric of this capacitor, and it will change the capacitance uh, in this in this in the sensor in this capacitor uh, capacitor uh, capacitance sensor, and the controller in the coffee machine's board will sense that and will consider that a button press. And why do people do that? Well, it's the same reason why we have touchscreen interfaces. That's exactly the same, tech, uh, same physics concept that is applied on your phone. 
Uh, it's the change in the capacitance uh, on the screen uh, that allows your phone to know where you're touching, uh, what pixel you're trying to activate at the moment. Uh, in this case, uh, of course, you don't want to uh, send the capacitance information, the raw capacitance information, uh, the signal, sorry, to your microcontroller through the, the guts of the, the machine, because that's super noisy, has a lot of electromagnetic noise. So what they've, uh, the, the, the designers of this machine have done is they, they're converting this into PWM before sending it down to, to the controller uh, of the machine. And once, it's PW, once it is PWM, I can um, just you know, uh, tap in with my microcontroller and inject my own signal there. Um, if, uh, capacitive buttons are quite hard to, to hack because you need to simulate, uh, they're designed to simulate, uh, de designed to actually measure the, 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 capacitance, uh, the capacitance change provoked by your finger getting close to the button. So it's very hard to simulate a finger, a human finger. Uh, so it was much easier just to, to, to inject the PWM signal that is generated uh, uh, by, by the machine. Um, as a sensor, uh, so the machine has a bunch of LEDs on the top and those LEDs report uh, the state of the machine. So it, it will tell the user uh, if the machine has enough water, it will tell the user if the machine has enough coffee beans or, or if uh, there is a door that shouldn't be open in the machine. And um, there are two ways to do that. There are two ways to light these LEDs and control them. You can use eight wires for the eight LEDs and, and, and drive them directly from eight GPIO pins. That's extremely inefficient. It's, it's using eight wires that are going to go through the guts of the machine and then your PCB is going to be huge. And that's totally inefficient. So there's a smarter way to do that. You can use SPI. SPI uses two uh, pins, one data and one clock. And uh, what the data pin actually transfers is the uh, it, it, it's like a bit, it's a binary signal, right? So uh, after eight clock cycles, you're going to have eight bits of information. And for this use case, one is the LED state on and uh, zero is the LED state off. So what is the disadvantage of, of using the system? Well, it's a, it's a serial protocol, right? So uh, you need to wait for the eight bits to arrive before transferring them to the to the LED. Well, we don't need to wait, but in this in this case, this machine waits, and so that's eight times lower than a parallel eight wire communication to the LEDs. But who cares? Like in the morning when you're trying to make your coffee, you're not going to detect and you're going to perceive the the microsecond uh, the machine to extra microsecond that the machine took to to light to, to indicate its status. So it's perfect for this application and it's super cool. You can use the wire library uh, in Arduino and just to uh, the Arduino li uh, wire library in, in the ESP and just um, uh, get this information and, and you, you, you try to provoke the LEDs to, to, to light on or off and then you see what is the signal and then at the end you just have a conversion table uh, to, 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 inform, to inform the microcontroller exactly what is the state uh, of your machine at that point. Uh, so that's a lot of talking, a lot of theory. Let's see this machine making some coffee. Okay, so this is the actual coffee machine uh, we came up with. Uh, there is a Raspberry Pi just behind the touch screen here, and this little screen is wired uh, to the microcontroller. Uh, remember that the Flutter app running here uh, does not uh, talk directly to the ESP8266. Uh, the commands that I'm going to tap here, they go uh, to the server that is deployed on Kates, and then they'll be executed at the machine. So let's make some coffee. Uh, I was actually planning to take this machine to the convention so we could all have some coffee together, but uh, well, that all went virtual, so. Um, and here is the actual core of this project, the fact that you can deploy the same stack of apps uh, on whatever cloud you choose. So I'm just gonna pick Google Cloud here. And then I can double tap the screen just to load some stats from the machine. So uh, what I'm actually doing is requesting the ESP to read the sensors from the machine and they are reporting the machine is healthy, apparently. And yeah, I can say here who I am and I just want to create some nice stats showing who likes what kind of coffee and then I'm going to make an Americano. I need a cup.
actually quite a good coffee. Yeah, so I've talked a lot about my project here and about how I'm using electronics to hack into the coffee machine. But I uh, now I want to invite you to look around and, and think about appliances that you can hack at home. Uh, if you do not know anything about electronics, uh, I wanted to give you some tips on how to get started. First of all, get yourself an ESP8266. Uh, that's a super useful microcontroller board that has a Wi-Fi built into and, and it's out of the box. You can uh, connect your server and super easy to use. You can program with the Arduino IDE. You can use most of the Arduino libraries uh, and there are tons of communities out there willing to help you. Uh, they're available um, um, by themselves or you can buy in a bundle and people will generally tell you to avoid the bundles but I would actually encourage you to, to buy the bundles and uh, they will make you curious to use the, the, the sensors and the components uh, in, in your projects and you're going to learn a, a bunch if you're getting started. Uh, also, do not get only sensors, uh, get actuators, get a, a servo to interact mechanically with your, with your environment, get a relay board to actually control uh, high power uh, appliances. Uh, get a multimeter, it doesn't need to be a good multimeter, good multimeters are expensive, it, it just needs to measure DC voltage and um, it needs to beep, it needs to measure the, the conductivity uh, between two points uh, to check if you're not shorting anything. Also get yourself a breadboard uh, so we don't need to be soldering all the time or you don't need to learn how to solder if you don't know. Um, and uh, they're pretty decent for most of the, the projects involving microcontrollers anyways. So that's it for me. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, and thank you very much for all the maintainers of the open source projects that, have, that we used in this, in this project. And you can find the details about them and at, uh, at the link at jujuis uh, slash brew. And thank you. Thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to use the chat here or reach out to us on Mattermost, Discourse, or social media, for which you can find all the links on this slide. Also, we are running the second version of the Kubernetes and Cloud Native Operations Survey and would appreciate your time filling it in. The results and raw data will be available on the Juju IS website in a month. This presentation, the code used to deploy these services, and some interesting metrics will also be available at juju.is forward slash brew.